Hey folks, Quilly Team here, and welcome to another episode of our Civilization VI tutorial for complete beginners. In this episode, we're going to deal with our builder, we're going to deal with a city-state, and we're also going to look at diplomacy a little bit more, while also continuing to expand our empire. In fact, I suspect very soon we'll be starting on our very first settler. So, last episode, we did discover a city-state over here of Seoul. City-states are not other players. They just have a single city, they never expand, um, they, as far as I know, will never declare war on a player with the exception of the suzerain vassal relationship, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So what's the deal with city-states? Well, if you click on the city-state, uh, nameplate here, or instead, if I just escape out of this, if you click on the button over here for city-states, you'll get a list of the city-states. We only discovered one, which is Seoul. And again, I can click on it and get some information. Now, we can declare war on a city-state if we want to go and conquer them. That, that's fine. There's also this levy mil military button, but let's, let's hold off on that just a moment. The big thing that you do with city-states is you, you sort of passively have diplomacy with them by sending them envoys. Because we were the first person to meet Seoul, we automatically get one envoy over here with them. If someone had met Seoul before we did, we would have a zero over here. Because we have one envoy, we get this bonus. Every city-state gives you a bonus at 1, 3, and 6 Envoy. The uh, bonus at level 1 will always be plus 2 something in your capital. Well, except for, um, for commercial city-states, they give you plus 4 gold. But a city-state will either be scientific, industrial, militaristic, uh, religious, mercantile... Cultural? I think I forgot cultural. Anyway, basically, all the, the sort of different resources that you can produce, there will be one associated with that, including production in your cities. In this case, Seoul is a scientific city-state, which means at one envoy, it gives you plus two science in your capital. The level three, and all of them, the level one, is to give you something in your capital. And for all of them, the level three and level six is to give you bonus production in the appropriate district. Campus districts produce science all the time. That's what they that's what they're there for. And as a scientific city state, this will make your campuses produce more science and yet more science. They all work this way. Um, how do you get more envoys? Well, depending on your government, you will produce a certain amount of influence point every turn. So with our chiefdom religion er, um, government, we produce one influence point per turn, and every 100 influence, we get an extra envoy that we can then assign to any city-state that we have met. In addition to that, city-states tend to give you quests. This quest over here says they want us to produce a great merchant. We haven't talked about great people yet, but a great merchant is a great person. If we were to produce one, then they would get we would get an envoy with Seoul directly for free. Right, So you can get envoys that you can assign to cities, and then by completing quests, you can get envoys directly with a city as well. We will meet many of these city-states over the course of the game. Now, there is this suzerain bonus as well. The suzerain is the, the civilization that has the most envoys with a city-state. You need at least three. So you can see here, we need three envoys here and more than any other civilization. As other people start to influence these city-states, you'll see that number go up because that number will always represent one more than every other civilization and it has to be at least three. But every city-state has a unique, unique bonus for being the suzerain of that city-state. Uh, basically, the city-state becomes your vassal. That's what that term means. So if we have more envoys with Seoul than anyone else and you know, at least three, then the unique bonus from Seoul is that when we enter a new era, we get a random Eureka from that era. What's the era thing? Well, if we click on the tech tree and we scroll around, well, we can see here ancient era. And if I scroll, you'll see classical era and medieval era and so on. Basically, as soon as we research any technology that's in the classical era over here, we would be considered to have entered the classical era. By itself, that doesn't have any real significant bonuses. There's something with roads, but let's ignore that for now. But that's what this means over here. Whenever we'd enter a new era, Seoul would give us a Eureka for free. Hey, that's pretty good, actually. Not only that, but if you are the suzerain of a city-state and you're in a war against another civilization, that city-state will automatically join in your war, which is excellent. Furthermore, the levy military button over here is uh, if you are the suzerain, you can pay money to borrow all of their military units. 
and then you know you can go and kick some butt with that very very cool so that's city states uh we actually didn't actually really look at the uh, diplomacy that we can do with other people as well we met cleopatra and we said hi but if i actually click on cleopatra over here i can open the diplomatic interface with her we can find out about our relationship especially if i click on this button over here we're currently neutral but we can also see the things that are influencing a relationship something is giving us plus two a green two is positive um, but something else is giving us a minus four. She likes us because of something that happened, but hates us because of something else. And every turn, so you add these up, so right now we have a net of minus two, and over time, this is gonna drop our relationship and make it worse right now because we're running a negative. If we improve things, then we would be improving our relationship. Maybe we become friends, maybe we could even become allies, so on and so forth. I could send a delegation over to her. This, if I do this, let's do it. It costs 25 gold to do it. Will she say yes? Ooh. Oh, she's cranky. Oh, that's not good. Had we done that, I believe that would have been another positive over here. Plus it gives us a little bit of intel. Our access level over here is currently none. If we had any access, which can happen with delegations, also if we said trade routes to her, all kinds of different things can give us extra access. This is the sort of spy access or gossip access. Then we would find out things, for example, why she likes us or hates us. Also, we would also get news items that would tell us if you know she settled a new city or changed her government or something like that. So delegation is one way to do that. Sending trade is another. You can see we could try to declare friendship with her, although she's gonna say no. Yeah, <laughs> wow, she's really saying no to me over here. I could declare war on her if I wanted to. Uh, there's that line underneath that says warmonger penalty. When you declare wars, war declaring wars Taking cities, that sort of thing, gives you a warmonger penalty, which makes other civilizations not like you because you're warlike. In the ancient era, you don't get warmonger penalty for declaring war. It's just what happens in the ancient era, which means you also have to be on guard with that because the AI will not hesitate to declare war on you early in the game. But as the eras advance and civilizations become more mature and realize that war is a bad thing, warmonger penalties will go up and up and up and up. And in particular, for a surprise war, the penalties are 50% worse than normal, which means that um, later on, you almost never want to declare a surprise war. There are other ways to declare wars in a more formal manner, in a more dignified manner. And we'll probably deal with that later on. We could also try to make a deal over here. Right now, we don't really have anything. We don't have any luxuries to trade. We don't have any great works or cities to trade or anything like that. We could try to convince her to join us in a war against, say, the Congo over here. Um, and yeah, she says, I will not make this deal under any circumstance. I could say, make this deal more equitable. If she'd be willing, she might put some stuff on the side. Like say, oh yeah, I'll do it, but only if you offer me some gold. Which, by the way, if you click on here, you can do this. If I click again, I could change the number. I say, I'll offer you 130 gold. Of course, she doesn't want to. She's not interested at all. I could right click to remove it, do different things like that. But she says that she's got no desire at all to go to war against the Congo. But there are things like that that you can do. Maybe we'll get back to that later on. Um, oh, we've got a notice here that we have a unit available for promotion. If I click on that, it'll bring up the, the slinger because the slinger has been in a few battles. It's earned enough experience points. It's very hard to see, but there's a bar down here that shows your experience. We have got enough experience to go up a promotion level. And that's what this icon is here. Now, if I click on this, I will see the promotion tree for this unit. This is a promotion tree. It is identical for all ranged type units. Slingers, archers, crossbows, etc., etc. All have the promotion tree that looks the same. But melee units, anti-cavalry units, um, cavalry units, other types of units, they all have their own tree that is different from the range one. Now, here's the thing. If you do choose a promotion here, A, you'll get a bonus. That's cool. B, you will heal 50 hit points. Oh, that's very cool. C, it will end your turn. I don't think I want to end my turn next to this barbarian warrior. I do not feel safe doing that. Even healing 50 hit points, I'm not sure that we could survive another attack over here. So I think rather than promote, which would end my turn, I'm going to back away over here. Now, if I back away one step, the warrior can still reach me because he has a movement of two. I'm going to move away another one, which will then make it impossible for him to reach me because he could move one, two, but then he'd still be out of range. And honestly, I don't think he's going to do that because he'll be too busy fighting the warrior. What's the deal with this icon over here? This represents that this tile is within the zone of control of an enemy or another way to say it, it's adjacent enemy unit. 
Of course it is. I have an enemy unit here. If I were to move my Slinger from here to there, I would be entering a tile that is adjacent to an enemy. What happens with that? Well, when you enter a tile that's in an enemy zone of control, you cannot move out of it that turn. It's worth noting it doesn't eat all of your movement, okay? If I were to go in here, assuming I had full movement, if, let's say I was at two of two right now, I could move into here, I would still have one of two movement left, right? I wouldn't be out of movement, but I would be forbidden from leaving this square. I could still attack this guy, including if I were a melee unit. If I were a melee unit, I could still attack this guy, and if I were to win in melee, it would actually end my turn in his square after killing the unit, which would be fine. But it's important to note that I can't go here and then move away. Even if I had a thousand movement points, I couldn't move here and then move out. It just would be forbidden. But I'm going to go ahead and move here. Of course, because of his movement rate, he can't reach me. He could decide to go and chase me, but he won't actually be able to do that because if he moves here, this Barbarian will be moving adjacent to an enemy unit and therefore he won't be al allowed to leave that square. Or he could go from here into the woods. That's fine because you can always do it if, if you if you have your full movement. If it's your start of your turn, you can always move away from an enemy. That's okay. It's just you can't enter a square that's adjacent to an enemy and then leave on the same turn. So this guy could move into the forest, but it would eat all his turns, and he'd still be too far away. So I'm feeling very secure doing that. So I'm not promoting the Slinger. Note that I'm not able to do it right now because I am out of moves. So, all right, we'll do that next time. Choose production. Okay, we've got our, uh, our builder. Um, I do kind of want a monument because I would love more culture so that we could get more um, civics, as well as push out our borders some more. But I think for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and get a settler going on over here. And in particular, I want to compare buildings um, when we do unlock the um, the district stuff. So I'm going to queue up a settler. That's going to be fine. Our warrior over here, I'm going to move up this way. But, okay, so we've explored some more territory, which is actually really handy. And this oasis, I believe, and we can confirm this in the settler mode. Oh, I was going to say, this oasis spreads fresh water. But I can't settle here because it's too close to Seoul. Actually, there must be a city over here. Because look at the forbidden tiles. Tiles are forbidden if they're within six, three tiles of a city. Which means there must be a city right here. That's interesting. Could be Congo, but I'm betting it's probably another city-state, actually. We'll have to go and meet them. But I want to keep my warrior relatively close to Washington because when I build the settler, I'm going to want to have the warrior nearby to protect the settlers. Civilian units like builders and settlers have no combat strength. It's literally not listed. So they cannot fight. I mean, I can't attack with them, but more importantly, they can't defend themselves. And in fact, if a military unit moves onto a tile with a civilian unit like a builder or a settler, they get captured. They, someone could steal my settler or steal my builder if I'm not careful. Really, really scary in the early game. All right, anyway, for now, our builder, we can move him. He's got a movement rate of two. And you'll notice this thing here that says builds. By default, your builders can build three things, and that's it. After that, the builder goes away and vanishes. It's a limited use item. What are we going to start with? Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the uh, horses and then move counterclockwise down around here. I think that's pretty good. I could, you can see here, these are recommended improvements. It's saying, hey, why don't you build a farm over here? Or maybe you should build a mine over here. Yeah, these are all things that are pretty good. Um, in fact, and again, this is another example of the AI shows hints. These are not things that are bad, but they're not, often not optimal. For example, while building farms here in the long run is probably a really good thing, if I'm going to build a farm, I should probably start with the one on the wheat because the wheat by itself already produces more food, right? Like, or, or, well, yeah, this is a plains tile. Normally a plains produces one food, one production because it's got wheat on it. It already produces an extra food. So this is already a better tile. And if I build a farm on here, it's going to be even better. And, and no matter what, it's always going to be better than anything that this particular tile could do for us. So if I'm going to build a farm, I should build it on the wheat, but I think I'm going to go, I'm going to do horse into stone, into diamonds, and that'll be the end of my builder, and then maybe I'll need another one. All right, so let's go ahead. We're gonna move up over here. We, oh, we don't have animal husbandry yet. Oh, that's right, because I went astrology. Normally, normally I would have gone animal husbandry. Oops, that, bit of a mistake. My bad, my bad. All right, so I'm just gonna tell the builder that next turn, make your way onto the stone. So he sort of wasted a turn with the builder by moving to the wrong place, but it's not the end of the world. I just forgot. That I didn't take animal husbandry because I really want to show off the district system. So, 
our slinger. Okay, the warrior wants orders now. Um, I'm going to go this way to see what the heck's over here. Kabul, indeed. That is another city-state. And it's got a mission. Oh, they both want me to recruit a great merchant. That's a very convenient. If I were to get a great merchant, I would get an envoy of both of these. Out of curiosity, okay, I'm not the first person to meet Kabul because I have zero envoys. And actually, you can check the influence by, and it shows me that Congo has one envoy with them. So Congo met them first. Okay, well, that's fine. You don't always win the race. My slinger over here, now that I'm completely safe, I'm going to go ahead and use my promotion over here. Um, so this branch here immediately gives me just more pure offensive strength. I'm better at ranged damage, uh, range versus land units. Aerostorm is an even bigger bonus against land and naval units. And these stack, so this would be a total of plus 12 to my base, which is pretty good. Over here, this gives me a whopping plus 10 combat strength when I'm in a district or a fort. Note that your city itself counts as a district. So if the slinger is parked inside of a district, he will get a whopping plus 10 combat strength. I think for now I'm going to go down the left branch because it's much more likely that my my, um, my slinger is going to be roaming around as opposed to defending a city. So I'm going to take that. It's going to heal me my 50 hit points. You can see I'm almost full, but it does end the slinger's turn. See here we met a city-state and that the city-state has a quest for us. Next turn. Ah! She wants to send me a diplomatic delegation. She is spending 25 gold, and if I say yes, she will get intel into my nation. I could say no, so that she can't get the, the intelligence into my nation, but I'm going to say yes, because it should improve our relations. Let's go and see what, what happens now. Still please waiting, still between turns, there we go. Let me go and click on Cleopatra. How is our relationship? We're still neutral, no, still like that. Can I send you a delegation? She will say yes this time. Okay, good. So now that we've done that, there we go. So, we've got more information. Now, we can actually see why she doesn't like us. She, first impressions of you. Apparently our first impressions weren't very good. We, uh, apparently our Egyptian accent is really bad. Um, we offered her a hamburger and she didn't think that was very tasty. I, I don't know what was going on, but the first impressions were not good. This will decay over time, which is okay. We did have, apparently we had a friendly meeting. I mean, I was nice to her, but she just didn't like us at first. But we did send them a delegation. So overall, we're currently sitting at plus one. So our relation is going to slowly improve. And in fact, that should be better because the negative stuff will go away. Well, I guess all of it will fade away eventually, but overall it's good. We got some info. We can see her agenda. She is queen of the Nile. She likes civilizations with powerful militaries. And will try to ally with them to avoid damaging military conflicts. She dislikes civilizations with weak militaries. If you are weak, she will be completely unimpressed and is very likely, in fact, to denounce you and then later on start a war against you because she thinks you're a pushover. But if you have a strong military, then she wants to be best friends so the two of you can rule the world together. In addition to that, so every nation has a visible agenda. For the Congo, he wants people to spread their religion to him. Congo can't found a religion. That's one, that's their special trait. They cannot found their own religion. So they really want people to spread a religion to them, and they don't like it. If you have a religion and you don't spread it to him, he won't like you. But in addition, everyone's got a hidden agenda, and we don't know what that is until we improve our access level even more than that. Although you can often start to guess based on some of their reaction to different things. All right, so we met Kabul over there. So that explains why we won't be able to settle over in this direction. That's okay. We've got lots of places to settle. I would love to scout just north of Washington. Maybe we can get that done soon. This slinger here is still hurt. I'm going to tell him to fortify until healed. So he, again, he's just going to skip turns until he's at full health, and then he'll wake up again and ask me to do something. So with my warrior, I'm going to move basically towards Washington so that we can get the settler. Notice Washington has hit size three now, which is excellent. This builder is now in a position to finally do something. So he's sitting on the stone with actions. And you can see he's got this little panel here where you can do a variety of things. The suggested, the recommended thing is to build a quarry. A quarry is the improvement that you normally build on stone. If I build this, it will give us an extra one production. This is a permanent boost. So again, if we click on Washington and take a look at the tiles, this is currently producing two food and two production. So if I build the quarry, it'll actually be two food, three production for the rest of the game, which is pretty good. And in fact, later on, there may or may not be things that make quarries even better than that. So that sounds pretty good. The The other buttons, um, they're the possibility of building a farm. Later on, you will gain the ability to build farms on hills, so we could do that instead of a quarry, but that, I think, is 
pretty silly. Usually you want to improve resources. That's normally your default thing. There is another thing that you could consider doing later on. If we had the technology called masonry, we would be able to harvest the stone. This would be a one-time deal. It would give us instantly 29 production in Washington, but it would remove the stone from this tile. Are there times you might want to do this? Sure. If it was really important for you to rush something, you might consider doing that. The other thing is, if you knew for a fact you wanted to do something else with this tile that would invalidate the stone, maybe you'd want to build a district here or you want to build a world wonder and it had to be built on this tile because of some reason and you were going to lose the stone, you might be tempted to harvest the resource for a one-time boost rather than just having it go completely to waste. But that's pretty uncommon. Uh, there's another button here for the bulldozer, this is to remove features. It's kind of the same as the harvest, but this is used to remove forests or marshes. Um, if you uh, remove, or rainforest. If you remove a marsh, you get food. If you remove a forest, you get production. If you remove a rainforest, you get a little food and a little bit of production. But we're gonna go ahead and build the quarry on this tile. Oh, which gives us a Eureka uh, towards masonry, uh, presumably because we built a quarry. Uh, we could verify that if we take a look at masonry. Yeah, the boost was to build a quarry, which we have now done. Lovely. So we've done that. If we check our builder, we now have two builds left. Two builds. You Building an improvement uses a build. Removing a feature or harvesting something um, also uses a build. Removing a feature definitely does. I'm assuming harvesting does as well. Um, if you have to repair a tile, this can happen. Enemy units that come to into your territory they can stand on improvement and then pillage it. That will give them a bonus for pillaging and will make it so that you don't get to use the improvement anymore. You can still work the tile, but it's like the improvement isn't there at all. You can use your builders to repair those tiles. It doesn't use up a build, so that's nice to know. So we're going to hit next turn over here. I'm quite curious. I, presumably, I can mine this, which is interesting because I can't remove the rainforest. And as a Civ 5 player, that seems a little bit... I was not expecting that. Um, still a lot, a lot of things I haven't, like, completely loaded into my brain yet for the new version of the game. I'm going to go here because there's a little bit more area we haven't explored here. There we go. Notice, the, this is unexplored. This is areas we've explored but are currently in the fog. We don't know what's going on over here. If you're playing on a higher difficulty level... Oh! Trade delegation came here with some foo-foo. I will say you are most welcome. Excellent. I could send you a trade delegation back, but I a think I'm going to save my money for now, knowledge actually. Of astrology has no right to call himself a physician. All right, so we've unlocked astrology over here. This unlocks the Stonehenge Wonder, as well as the Holy Site District, and the Shrine Building, but the Shrine Building is something you build in a Holy Site District, so you'd have to build this first. So, now that we've done that, oh, we do think to cho choose our research. So we've got a big list. I guess I'm gonna take Animal Husbandry so I can actually improve uh, yeah, build a pasture on the horses here. Plus, at some point, we're going to want this cattle. So that seems okay. I'm also tempted to grab either masonry or the wheel because, of course, I have the boost for both of these. Um, if I take animal husbandry, I will be able to research archery, which I have the boost for. Archers are a ranged unit that are a big upgrade over the slinger. A slinger, if you recall, has a melee strength of 5 and a range strength of 15. Archers have a melee strength of 15 and a range strength of 25, but most importantly, they have a range of 2, whereas a slinger only has a range of 1. An archer is much, much more powerful than a slinger. Luckily, you can upgrade your slinger to an archer. I believe it costs 30 gold on standard speed to upgrade, and it gets to keep its promotion. So that slinger that's been out there doing some good work for us, we're going to be able to upgrade it with a bow and arrow. So what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to click on archery over here. It's going to queue up animal husbandry, followed by archery. I think that's excellent. We can work the uh, the horses, and then we'll get our archery tech and help protect us that much more. Okay, we're seven turns away from building the settler over here. When that is done, I'm almost certainly going to build the holy site to demonstrate how the district mechanic works. I think what we're going to do here is I am just going to go ahead and put a cut in this video, and I'm going to go ahead and advance uh, time in game i'm going to skip enough turns for our settler to be done so next episode we can talk about districts and we can also look at what we might want to do to settle things so of course i'm going to keep improving things with the builder we're going to go and improve the diamonds actually can i do that now i can do that now oh and it removes the rainforest now i don't have the that's interesting last chopping of woods huh 
You do need bronze working to be able to chop rainforest, but apparently in Civ 5 you would not have been able to build a mine on a tile that had rainforest until you had the tech that could remove the rainforest. But that is something slightly different here in Civ 6, and I don't think I don't think I'd really realize that until now. Well, clearly, I suppose. Hmm. Okay, so yes, we'll put a cut in here. Next episode, we'll look at districts, which are a significantly different feature in Civ 6 that we've never seen in any previous version of Civ. Thanks for watching. See you next time.